And when I say this I do not refer to mental imbalance so that can happen but to overdevelopment and overexpression in some part of his nature. He can become extravagantly overorganized through the medium of some overactive center, or underorganized and inactive. He is therefore subject to the imbalance of the glandular system, with all its attendant difficulties. His overstimulation or his undevelopment, where the centers are concerned, normally affects the gland, and they in their turn produce character difficulties which necessarily, in their turn, produce environmental problems as well as personality handicaps. It is then a vicious circle, and is all due to wrong direction of force and the inflow of force from one or other of the personality vehicles to its related center i.e., the astral force in its relation to the solar plexus, and then the appearance of the problems of health, of character and of influence. Over radiatory activity, through the medium of some center, attracts attention and the disciple becomes the victim of his own achievement. I shall deal with these at greater length when I take up the diseases which develop from the four categories. These difficulties are of a most general kind but will affect primarily second and sixth grade disciples. The one because the second ray is the building ray, and is therefore concerned predominantly with outer manifestation and with the utilization of all the centers, and the other because it is primarily the ray of tension, a tension which can work out in the form of the most evil fanaticism or the most altruistic devotion. All the rays present the same problems. Needless to say, but the second ray deals largely with the soul's activity through all the centers, those above and those below the diaphragm, but with the heart as the prime center of attention. The sixth ray has a close relation to the solar plexus center as the clearing house and the place of reorientation of the life force and the personality. Bear this constantly in mind. C. The problems connected with the respiratory or breathing system are all related to the heart, and therefore concerned with the establishing of right rhythm and right contact with the environment. The drawing in of the life breath, the sharing of the air with all other human beings, denotes both an individual center of life and participation also in the general life of all. To these problems of individual or separated existence and of its opposite, the sacred word, the Om, is intimately related. It might be said in the words of an occult manual on healing, given to advanced disciples, that he who lives under the sound of the AUM knows himself. He who lives sounding the OM knows his brother. He who knows the sound knows all. Then, in the cryptic and symbolic language of the initiate, the manual goes on. The breath of life becomes the cause of death to the one who lives within a shell. He exists but. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 79 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing He is not The breath then leaves and spirals to the whole He who breathes forth the OM knows not himself alone He knows the breath is prana, life, the fluid of connection the ills of life are his because they are the lot of man, not generated in a shell, because the shell is not. He who is the sound and sounding force knows not disease, knows not the hand of death. In these few words the whole problem of the third group of problems and diseases is summed up. They are concerned with the circulation of soul energy, 
which is the energy of love, and they are not concerned with the circulation of the life essence. These two basic energies, as they play upon the forces of the personality, bring about the bulk of the problems to which humanity falls heir. These are lack of love, lack of life, failure to sound forth correctly the note of the soul and of the ray, and failure to transmit. The secret of constituting a pure channel, to use mystic but not occult phraseology, is considered in the first group of problems, and the establishing of right relation by right sounding forth of the attractive note of the soul, is considered in the last two groups. This third group of difficulties, problems and diseases are of course those of people upon all the rays, the first grade people have a definite predisposition to these specific troubles. At the same time, when they rightly utilize their latent powers, they can overcome by the right use of the ohm, and finally of the sound, the incidental problems and difficulties far more easily than those on other rays. You have here a reference to the lost word of masonry and to the sound of the ineffable name. The sound of the AUM, the sound of the OM, and the sound itself, are all related to vibration and its differing and varied effects. The secret of the law of vibration is progressively revealed as people learn to sound forth the word in its three aspects. Students would do well to ponder on the distinction between the breath and the sound, between the process of breathing and the process of creating vibratory activity. They are related but distinct from each other. One is related to time and the other to space and, as the old commentary puts it, the sound, the final and yet initiating sound, concerns that which is neither time nor space. It lies outside the manifested all, the source of all that is and yet is not, or no thing. A.A.D. For this reason, disciples on the fourth ray usually can develop by the power of the intuition and understanding of the O.M. This ray of harmony through conflict, the conflict of the pairs of opposites, is necessarily concerned with the bringing in of that vibratory activity which will lead to unity, to harmony and to right relations, and to the release of the intuition. D. The problems incident to the activity of inactivity of the centers are perhaps the most important. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 80 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing From the standpoint of disease, because the centers govern the glandular system and the glands have a direct relation to the bloodstream and they condition also the major and most important areas in the human body, they have both a physiological and a psychological effect upon the personality and its interior and exterior contacts and relations. The reaction is primarily physical but the effects are largely psychological, and it is therefore this fourth group upon which I shall principally enlarge, dealing with the diseases of disciples and giving some definite instructions upon the centers. This will indicate more clearly than elsewhere the causes of the many human ills and physical difficulties. Before proceeding to our next point, try to grasp somewhat more fully the laws of healing and the rules given thus far and repeated here to facilitate your endeavors. Law I all disease is the result of inhibited soul life and this is true of all forms of all kingdoms. The art of the healer consists in releasing the soul so that its life can flow through the aggregate of organisms which constitute any particular form. Law 2 
disease is the product of, and subject to, three influences. First, a man's past, wherein he pays the price of ancient error. Second, his inheritance, wherein he shares with all mankind those tainted streams of energy which are of proof origin. Third, he shares with all the natural forms that which the Lord of Life imposes on his body. These three influences are called, the ancient law of evil sharing. This must give place someday to that new, law of ancient dominating good, which lies behind all that God made. This law must be brought into activity by the spiritual will of man. Law 3. Diseases are an effect of the basic centralization of a man's life energy. From the plane whereon those energies are focused, proceed those determining conditions which produce ill health, and which, therefore, work out as disease or as freedom from disease. Law IV. Disease, both physical and psychological, has its roots in the good, the beautiful and the true. It is but a distorted rejection of divine possibilities. The thwarted soul, seeking full expression of some divine characteristic or inner spiritual reality, produces within the substance of its sheets a point of friction. Upon this point the eyes of the personality are focused, and this leads to disease. The art of the healer is concerned with the lifting of the downward focus eyes unto. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust. 81. A Treatise on the Seven Rays. Volume 4. Esoteric Healing. The Soul, the Healer within the Form. The spiritual or third eye then directs the healing force, and all is well. Rule 1. The healer must seek to link his soul, his heart, his brain and his hand. Thus can he pour the vital healing force upon the patient. This is magnetic work. It cures disease, or increases the evil state, according to the knowledge of the healer. The healer must seek to link his soul, his brain, his heart and auric emanation. Thus can his presence be the soul life of the patient. This is the work of radiation. The hands are needed not. The soul displays its power. The patient's soul responds through the response of his aura to the radiation of the healer's aura, flooded with soul energy. Rule 2. The healer must achieve magnetic purity, through purity of life. He must attain the dispelling radiance which shows itself in every man when he links the centers in the head. When this magnetic field is established, the radiation too goes forth. Rule 3. Let the healer train himself to know the inner stage of thought or of desire of the one who seeks his help. He can thereby know the source from which the trouble comes. Let him relate the cause and the effect, and know the point exact through which the help must come. Rule 4. The healer and the healing group must keep the will in leash. It is not will that must be used but love. 2. Difficulties incident to soul contact Today we begin a study of the difficulties, the diseases and the psychological troubles, neurological and mental, of the aspirants and of the disciples of the world. These we shall study definitely from the angle of the seven centers, as well as considering the results of the forces and energies, I use these distinctive words advisedly which pour through them. Much that I shall say will be open to question from the viewpoint of orthodox medicine, yet, at the same time, orthodox medicine has been steadily drifting towards the occult point of view. 
I shall not attempt to relate the esoteric attitude of healing, its propositions and methods, to the modern schools of therapy.